Well, hello everyone, and thank you for checking into this short interview we have with Sean Cooley. Uh, my name's John Harris. I'm the International Education uh, Lead at the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. And as part of preparing for the Central Asia Trade Forum coming up in November, where Sean will be appearing, we wanted to take some time out to have some insight time with Sean to talk about embracing change and perhaps the new normal that is emerging post pandemic. So with no more ado, welcome to Sean. Um, if you want to find out more about him, just check out his website there at www.seancooley.com. Just a little bit about Sean if uh, he is a new face to you. Uh, Sean is actually an award-winning keynote speaker and author of Transition Point, From Steam to the Singularity. And that's an in-depth examination of the causes of technological progress and how the current wave of change will disrupt our business models, economy, and the society at large. He's had over 25 years of experience in supply chain transformation, including 10 years as the design authority on some multi-multi-million uh, SAP implementation projects and also taking on CEO roles as well. He's a visiting fellow at Cranfield University here in the UK and a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport and also holds a number of designations and recognitions. So a very, very warm welcome to Sean. Thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure, John. Always great to support the CILT. Okay. And I know that uh, the Trade Forum is really looking forward to you being a part of the panel. And that's coming up on the 16th of November, uh, a little bit away. But this gives a chance for people to see a little bit of an insight into Sean Cooley's head. And of course, <laughs> hopefully, they'll have a little delve into your book uh, in the meantime. Yeah, I hope so. so we're just going to have a bit of an armchair conversation. And uh, I just want to kick off with a, a, a question, really. Um, obviously, the pandemic, we're still in the midst of it. Here in the UK, we're, you know, bracing ourselves for what we call the second wave. And so are many other countries as well. Now, a lot of talk about this is negative. But often, after a forest fire event like this, new shoots of opportunity emerge. So what opportunities do you think will arise out of the pandemic? And how could a country or business take advantage of them? Over to you, Sean. Well, first, thanks, thanks, John. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm speaking to you from quarantine myself over here in the UK. <laughs> I, uh, I travelled out to speak in Prague um, a week or so ago, so I'm currently sitting out my quarantine, only to go back out to Prague next Tuesday to then come back and do another two weeks in quarantine. So, uh, yes, we are living in strange times indeed. Um, I think the point you make is a very interesting one. Um, one of the major forces that I talk about um, that is driving sort of technological change and has done since the Industrial Revolution is the forces of creative destruction. Yeah. Um, and that effectively, that um, was named by um, a gentleman called Joseph Schumpeter, an Austrian economist, who says, look, you know, what's, from, creation, from creation comes to destruction. So in the development of new things, we see the destruction of old things, old ways, old technologies, old industries, unfortunately. And of course, when you see that, you tend to focus on the destruction element of it because it's obvious and it's quite quick. So people are concerned right now with the, uh, the pandemic about the destruction of jobs and industries, and quite rightly so. But behind the scenes, what this is creating is a massive sense of urgency, I think, to embrace a lot of technological developments that actually were already on the in the development life cycle and probably in, in some cases we're in sort of Gartner's um, trough of disillusionment where people had heard about them a couple of years ago but hadn't seen them so they almost forget about them but what the pandemic has done is created a real drive for um, embracing some of these technologies um, specifically in some cases because we we are avoiding sort of any biological methods of of contact with each other or with, uh, with goods and services. So things like robotics, autonomous drones, road robots, all those things have suddenly got a massive incentive. And if you look, if you understand these waves of change, the period we're in right now is, is the most dangerous and the most disruptive period. But if we get through it unscathed, and it is always a bit of a if we've managed it every time so far, but, um, but if, we, if we get through it unscathed, then, um, you know, a golden age is usually what we, we morph into because all of these industries effectively become um, 
industrialized and things that have been working on for some time, we've, you know, new forms of energy production, um, new forms of transportation, new forms of communication, you know, solving some of the problems of the last wave, the industrial age, like, you know, the fact that, you know, the sustainability issues that we've been trying to address and being able to use tools like artificial intelligence and point them at some of our biggest problems, which enables us to move forward into the next stage of the wave actually being able to solve some of these challenges and of course in solving those challenges you create new industries which creates new jobs which creates new opportunities and new skills and the danger really comes with people who can't let go of the past who are so hung on to past ways of doing things that they can't embrace these future opportunities because these opportunities are many mm, really really interesting let me let me pick up on that there sean so Obviously, the coronavirus and the impact of what's happening, it, it, if you like, we're not going through a nudge phase. We're going through a quite a big shove phase. Yeah. And um, from what you're saying there, human behavior and people's resistance to change and the fact they've always done it this way is actually one of the biggest threats. Um, I know that you've given examples from the retail sector, but with this kind of what I call the shove factor, mm -hmm. Do you think the shoving, who should it come from? Should it come from the market? Should it come from inventors? Should it come from governments? Who, who's the shover in this scenario? Well, I think, I think all three, if I'm honest. Um, I mean, the, the waves are driven usually by the entrepreneur and the innovator and, and the embracement of new ways of doing things. Um, the leader of organisations, the incumbent organisations, needs to be savvy enough to realize that the market is necessarily changing and therefore to lead his organizations through the change. And I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges a lot of organizations are facing right now. Their leadership has been trained in what I call the downswing of the previous wave. So it's been, if you, that downswing behavior is very different to upswing behavior. So we're in the upswing right now, which is all about experimentation and entrepreneurship and innovation. The downswing is, was much more about efficiencies and exploitation of existing investments. So if you think about the period up to sort of 2008, it was all around cost control and leaning and offshoring and cutting costs. And, and leaders were designed to specifically manage that, to manage shareholder expectations, to control costs, to maximize profits. It was all very firm centric, you know, um, activities. Whereas now leadership is, is really concerned not so much about the firm, but what's going on around the firm from the black swans to the new types of technology, completely different mindset, completely different skill set required. And of course, the, the, the market itself and the consumers are demanding things. So they are um, either demanding change through the pandemic. So, you know, for example, you know, contactless payment, for example, you know, we don't like handling cash all of a sudden. The things that we've done forever, you know, hand like physical cash, suddenly no one really wants to touch physical cash because, you know, obviously other people have touched it. And then you see things like, um, you know, the laggards, people like more senior citizens who normally would embrace things like um, e-commerce or contactless payments or those sorts of things, having to effectively embrace those things. But you also see the innovators. So just yesterday, for example, um, Elon Musk, no, sorry, not Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, I apologize for my entrepreneurs mixed up, Jeff Bezos um, <laughs> announced that, um, you know, Am and Amazon announced that it was using palm readers in its... Um, and it's basically in its ghost stores and looking to rubble it out. So effectively biometric scanning. Now, that was a really interesting um, development because um, Amazon had been working on using finger and thumbprint identifications for payments. And of course, we now, because of the pandemic, don't like touching things. We don't want to touch anything. So I don't really want to put my thumb on a thumb scanner because actually who else put their thumb on a thumb scanner before me? Whereas, you know, scanning my palm remotely is a completely new approach. And that's the innovator taking the opportunity to move the market forward. And, but once that gets rolled out, then other, of course, what that's gonna do is cause an exponential shift in consumer expectations. I want to go to stores where I don't have to get my phone out or my wallet out or cash out. And that therefore means that the leaders who are in that space have to rapidly think, well, how do we embrace these kinds of technology as well? So I think um, all of these are true. Governments have to play a part, I think, in, um, in helping their, their nations embrace these technologies, helped by providing the skill sets, by, by training the future generations, mm -hmm. by embracing things like, you know, you know sustainability and, and other incentives to help companies to move towards a um, direction that we ultimately need to go by once the technology is there to help them. So I think, I don't think there's one or the other, I think it's all three, and all three has this place. Great. 
if we take a kind of helicopter view now, um, mm -hmm. I mean, the turn you describe here are waves of creative destruction, you know, and the downswing and the upswing. Um, two part question. First of all, what what's the big picture here, Sean? What's the implication of those waves globally, do you think, over the next year, five years, say? Um, well, if you, the, the waves that, the waves are about fifty to sixty years long, and this is one of the interesting things I, I observed is that you know our, our change is not linear or cyclical, and we go through these waves of capitalist change, and and it affects obviously the market economies um, much more than it does to the the, the non market economies, more communist style economies, which is why it affected you know the West and and you know the US and Europe and the UK and Japan and didn't really affect places like so, you know, Soviet Russia for example or China previously however those economies are now embracing you know more market forces and free market forces so it's affecting them as well the Upside element is, is as I say, it's, it's a, this is a very dangerous time. If you look back, all the wars and all the revolutions happen at pretty much this point in the wave cycle, because what you've got is you've got new forces emerging um, and you've got old, old forces trying to retain their powers. And you've also got an inequality between people who have capital and people who have labor. Um, and those causes, you know, quite social um, unrest and social disruptions. Um, I'll give two examples that you, you can see right now, the sort of, um, saber rattling between the US and China, for example, um, and the sort of forces that are going on there. You've got the US, which is effectively a country divided right now. Um, and, and, and that looks particularly precarious. And I think as we move into the election, election I do worry about the United States and what happens there. Um, you've got um, China, which is trying to retain you know, control of its citizenship through using a lot of these new technologies from things like social credit systems and other such tools in order to maintain overall control, you know, of, of the population and keep and sort of keep that balance. So you've got you've got all of these different forces. But like but the interesting thing is because these waves are so long, most people haven't been through one before. So they, because they experience in this type of phenomenon for the first time, they think it's new. But the reality is it isn't. This is the sixth wave. We are in the upswing period, the sixth wave. There's been five waves before this. And during each one of those, these periods in those waves, we have had very similar discussions. And I'll give you a good example. Um, one of the things I found really interesting is one of the, something that's talked about a lot right now is universal basic income or citizen income, which is the ability to say, right, in these disruptive waves where we're looking at potentially mass technological unemployment, where automation may wipe out a large number of jobs, how do we provide for, um, for our citizenship so they continue to survive and become sort of consumers that enables the, the capitalist model to continue? And the, people, and the answer that people are coming up with it is we'll give people money. We'll, everyone will have a certain amount of money. Um, Andrew Yang in the United States, for example, one of the Democratic um, candidates said, he, he phrased it in a way I really like, which he said, you know, capitalism that doesn't start at zero, you know, it, start at, it starts at a thousand dollars, you know, you get a thousand dollars every month. So there is no rock bottom, effectively. Everyone has something. The interesting thing for my research is what I didn't appreciate was that that discussion and that solution has been raised at this point in every wave cycle from the very first industrial revolution in the 18th century by Thomas Pence and Thomas Spain, all the way through to the last wave where people like Milton Friedman were talking about it and, you know, um, you know other, other such people were talking about it around there, that, that time period. And because of that right now, we have people like, you know, um, Andrew Yang, who's discussing it. So it's come up as the same solution. Now, up until the current wave, this has not been required. We've gone through, you know, there has been more winners than losers from these waves. This time round, I'm sceptical. I'm skeptical because I think what we're seeing now is relatively unique, which is the creation of automation and machines that are not only replacing jobs in the same way that every other wave has created machines that replace jobs, but machines that are effectively replacing human capabilities. Yeah. And that's, that's what concerns me. And I think if, if all you've got to trade is the things on the end of your wrists and the sweat on your brow, then it could be a very difficult time moving forward. Yeah. I mean, putting that into uh, very simple terms, um, in any economy or any society, we have a mix, don't we, of, of doers, mm -hmm. thinkers, planners and strategists, don't we? We do, yes. And what this is doing is, is almost putting that into a big mixing bowl and actually saying, well, you know, <laughs> we've got people with talent, but there's going to be quite a lot of change if those people are going to be redeployed and, and reused 
for the benefit of the economy. So if we turn that to even a, a regional context, so regardless of politics or the, the type of government, um, do you think wherever we are in the world, there is kind of going to be a, a power to small, medium enterprises and entrepreneurs that every country should be nurturing that talent in some shape or form? Otherwise, you know, the, the mixing bowl I referred to, you know, half of those ingredients are, are not going to be used. I, th I think that's absolutely correct. I, one of the points I make in my book is that, you know, this is this is going to be a great time for entrepreneurship. You know, the, the opportunity now using a lot of these uh, technological platforms that we have to reach a global marketplace. You know, this, we've never had this before. You know, there's never been the opportunity to basically design a product and then say, sell it on Amazon and being able to reach, you know, effectively a billion consumers, you know, from your bedroom. You, you th that, that opportunity has never arisen before. So I think what you're going to see is a mix. I think you're going to see, you know, a number of large um, technology companies create, you know, at the platform owners, the people who own the, the effectively own the data and only the intervals. They're going to be the, the, the lords of the new wave, if you want to go, the, the lords of the manor, so to speak. Um, but there's a great opportunity via a number of different platforms for people to create um, what Kevin Kelly called a thousand fans. If you can create a thousand fans, a thousand people who love what you do, then you can create a pretty good income for yourself. So there is a massive opportunity to reach out to this, you know, global marketplace um, and from everything from, you know, your music to selling your products and, and create a sort of micro entrepreneurship. What I think is going to be different this way is, is career paths. The traditional start at an organization, come in when I'm 20, work hard, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be here till I'm 65 and get a gold watch and a pension. I don't foresee that kind of environment um, lasting much longer. And in fact, it hasn't been lasting right now. People have, you know, companies are finding things like final salary pension schemes unaffordable. You know, then people are not looking for long-term careers. They're looking for um, exciting opportunities right now. They're not prepared to do the drudge work in, in, on the promise of, you know, future rewards. A lot of the new um, entrants really want exciting, innovative work from the get-go. Um, and organizations really aren't, aren't setting out sort of long-term careers with the exception probably of public sector anyway. So I think that sort of traditional fifth wave industrial age, long career path, one corporation thing has gone. But we think what we've got in the places is, is a lot of micro entrepreneurship one thing I do worry about about that, um, and, and the gig economy, of course, is part of that, the ability to do multiple little jobs uh, and sign on and sign off and do, you know, I could do a you know, delivery driver for Deliveroo or for Amazon or for a number of these, makes a bit of income. And then at night time, I could do, go on to Fiverr or freelancer.com and do web design because I'm interested in web design and, and get paid for that. But each one of those is precarious. And that's the, one of the challenges I raise in my book, which is, you know, given our society and our economy is um, predicated around um, things like credit worthiness and your ability to, re if you want to own property, your ability to repay debt over the long term, which is, again, you know, it's predicated on your earning potential over the long term. And that's usually based around things like salary. If, if your income is made up of a lot of small, completely insecure zero hours contract style works, how do, they, how do these organizations get the security that, that you have the ability to repay these kind of loans? And I think that's where I see a bit of a disconnect moving forwards. I think some of our systemic things, the changes need to happen to enable people to, um, to be able to afford some of the assets that we took for granted in some of the previous ways. Yeah, definitely. I guess there's got to be some structural change to make sure that those micro businesses and entrepreneurs uh, feel protected. Yeah. I totally agree with you. We've moved away from a job for life to a life of jobs, but it's not even as simple as a life of jobs anymore because the technology and the automation is, is rapidly catching up and overtaking. Um, you mentioned the skills issue. I mean, what's your view? CILT as a global organization involved with training, we've been challenged by having to almost shove everybody online and to be clever in the way in which they carry on dealing with skilling and learning what's your view on how education and training might have to to change to cope with the the creative wave well i think i, I think that's one of the areas where we will have to see a lot of change um you know we we have 
we have an industrial age businesses with industrial age management and industrial age education systems. So we've for a long time now put people in rows, taught them the same subject and, and you specialize to an extent, you know, whether or not you're looking at accountancy or finance or whether or not you're going into supply chain or whether or not you're going into, you know, the, the law, whatever it is. But ultimately, people sort of had this for three hours and the basic training, and then they went into that sort of area. What I think we have to have now is much more blended style of training that's much more personalized, um, that allows people to customize what they want to become. And also some of the sort of expectations around, um, you know, what jobs are going to be there are changing rapidly. So, for example, we have in supply chain trained people for a long time on things like, you know, SNOP and forecasting and, and sort of planning kind of tools. Um, but now, of course, you know, we're seeing you know, these sort of cognitive computing solutions coming up and tools like DDMRP and stuff like that that's really changing the very sort of paradigms of, you know, how we plan and replenish orders because, you know, the, the, the expectations of consumers have grown exponentially. The number of different delivery points have grown exponentially. The technology that's capturing all of this data has grown exponentially. And it's going to explode when we move into the Internet of Things when 5G becomes ubiquitous in the next 18 months. So basically, humans are becoming increasingly limited by their capabilities to process all of this data, to make sense of it, to plan it, and to actually have something that actually then the business can follow and go, yeah, I, but I trust that. It, there's just too much data, too many variables, and it's coming too fast. So we're having to rely heavily on technology, which means the role goes from sort of data cruncher and, and sort of um, sort of tr forecaster into someone who can be, you know, have more inquiry skills and analytical skills and look at what the recommendations the machines are actually telling us and to think much more strategically about this information than, than being more operational and tactical. So a lot of the courses that we used to teach, I think, um, have a life span and, and are probably valid right now, but probably won't be in five years. Excellent. I'm going to uh, ask my last question now, and uh, this is bringing it back to the Central Asia Trade Forum and some of the things that will be discussed there. Now, obviously, even within the Central Asia region, we, we have a colourful mix of cultures, histories, heritage, etc. So even within the CATF we're having people coming from different countries with different perspectives. Um, my final question is, is, is around the hyper convenience. You, you mentioned that the, the hyper convenience thing is, is beginning to feature more within the Western world, but what happens in cultures and societies where historically we, we weren't wired for that? So putting very simply, we love going to the shops every day because there is something really special about the social value and the social contact and the human interaction. Uh, and as we've seen from the pandemic, many people have repeatedly saying, well, about society's well-being, we, we, are, we are human, we want to see each other. So what would your response be that even if all the mass added up, actually culturally people don't want to change because they just love the human interaction? Um, I think that's a very valid point. There's something that worries me greatly. And I, I, I've, um, I've got a chapter in the book called Basic Income Bread and, Vir and Virtual Circuses, where I talk about um, potentially some of the social ramifications of a lot of these changes and how I worry about the, the, the new generations. And I, and, and I see this for myself with my own two sons um, becoming in, you know, increasingly technological dependent, but socially isolated and remote. And that um, does not have a positive um, effect on, on mental well-being. And, and I, I worry about this moving forwards. You know, I think culturally, you know, we, we can quite easily say we love going to the shops and we love doing that. And I think that that, that is true to a certain extent. Um, I, I could fall into the sort of traditional male, female things. Of, females love going to the shops and the men get dragged along um, <laughs> willingly. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and certainly I would put myself very much into that camp. You know, I, um, I, I'm quite happy to embrace the e-commerce revolution because, uh, you know, I find shopping to be a bore. And my wife, however, completely loves that, that sort of social in, and, and the picking objects up and that sort of thing. I think the, you've got, there is a, um, something called a cultural lag that I talk about in my book, which is, you know, you have people who embrace things um, quite early on, and then you have other people who will not embrace them because they don't socially feel right. 
And that cultural lag um, generally delays um, technological adoption in, in, in some respects, because, um, you know, as you say, you know, a lot of people, especially a lot of senior people, haven't embraced e-commerce because um, going out and walking around is a, is a exercise and B it's social interaction and it get, you know gets them out of the house, gets them to see other people and yeah. and breaks up what may may be a, a very relatively they feel a very relatively lonely existence if families have grown up and moved away. Um, the pandemic has changed that a little bit. Um, and in fact, I'd, I'd, I'd correct that, it's changed it a lot. Um, and I'll use my own parents as an example. I think it's always good to use personal reference. My parents wouldn't, had not embraced the e-commerce revolution. They were very much physical shoppers. But um, they had to isolate. They were in the at-risk categories. They were forced to use e-commerce because they had no choice. They couldn't leave the house. Suddenly, the, the big scary of going online and the concerns about putting in your credit card numbers into a computer and all the things that people perceive to be issues weren't issues anymore because they had no choice. And then once they embraced it, they go, hang on, this is really convenient. I don't, I, I, why would I go to a store anymore? Why do I go? So there is, I think, a lot of people who are going to make that shift because of the pandemic. Moving back to your point about Central Asia, I think you're right. And the, the sort of market culture and the going and association is, is very embedded in those cultures. But I also, it was also very embedded in British culture for a long time. I grew up in a market town, um, a place called Kings Lynn. Um, it had a Tuesday market and a Friday market, and a, sorry, Saturday market. And, and those markets were everywhere and everyone went to the market. Everyone went to the market. We could buy everything. There is no Saturday or Tuesday market anymore. They don't exist. Um, so they, the culture has shifted as technology has advanced. So I think, I think it's almost in, inevitable it will change. Um, I think there are some worrying social downsides to that. I think we, as human beings, we are social creatures. But I do see some positives. I do see positives. And the positives I see is... Um, in the fifth wave, for example, you know, the, the whole shopping experience was predicated around the motor vehicle. We were driven around the motor vehicle, specifically going out of town, shopping centres, supermarkets, um, those sorts of things, shopping malls. That's changing dramatically. And what we're seeing now is an increasing pedestrianisation of the high street, yeah. which is giving it a new life. And, and rather than just pure shops, um, which most of the stuff you can buy online, what we're seeing now is, is a cafe culture emerge and increasing restaurations. Um, you know, uh, areas set up for children to play, more trees being planted in shopping centres. And I think that's a real positive. I think rather than just the, the, the high street has died, which a lot of people have talked about, yes, it has in its old form, but it's being reborn, to use your first point, you know, out of the ashes is coming a new high street that actually is, you know, much more multi-purpose, much more pedestrian friendly, much more family friendly, you know, and, 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 and has adapted to the new reality. Brilliant. I mean, out of the ashes is a really good way to end this interview, actually, because okay. we are on this this upward curve where we can only see good things happening. I think part of the secret will be making sure they happen at the right time, in the right place and at the right speed. I think so, yeah. And Sean, thank you for giving us that oversight that just covers not just the technological and the institutional issues, but importantly, those social, behavioural and cultural ones as well. Sean, it's been a delight to spend this time with you, as always. Yep. We look forward to your um, appearance uh, at the online Central Asia Trade Forum later in November. Now, if you want to find out more about Sean and hopefully have a little look at his book, um, here's some information that you can uh, go to. Um, you can... Uh, get hold of the book on a number of channels and you can also get in touch directly with Sean. His email is there. So with no more ado, I just want to say a very big thank you um, from the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport and also from the Central Asia Trade Forum uh, for what you've done today. And we're looking forward to seeing you later in November. Thanks, John. Always a pleasure. Lovely to speak Stay to you. Safe. Take care.